What's up, everybody? Russell Lewis here. I just interviewed the GOAT. In terms of air battle managers, she is the epitome of air battle managers and what it is to be an air battle manager. But she is extremely humble. And I was surprised at just how humble she was. She is amazing. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about the one and only General Lori Robinson. She is a part of Air Force history. In 2014, she became the commander of Pacific Air Forces in Hawaii, making her the first United States female four-star general to command combat forces. So in 2016, she went on to make history yet again. She became the commanding general of United States Northern Command and was the first woman to command a unified combatant command. And I, little old Captain Russell Lewis, got to interview her. It was awesome. She's amazing. I am a captain in the United States Air Force. I am an air battle manager, and I created a platform where civilian and military members can connect with the next generation of leaders. I understand the importance of mentorship because it changed my life. And I want to make sure that everybody gets that opportunity. So without further ado, welcome to Mentorship Moment. Everybody, welcome back to another Mentorship Moment. I am joined with a legend. And she is humble, so she's going to say she's not. But in my opinion, she definitely is the one and only General Lloyd Robinson. What's going on, ma'am? How are you? I'm awesome. I'm in Florida. It's a beautiful day. I'm looking out over the water. There's dolphins and sea rays out there. How could I be any better? I am so excited about this interview. And we kicked it off on an amazing start, I must say. You let me know uh, your thoughts on fu the future of our career field, which is air battle management and air battle managers. And would you share a few words for those brand new lieutenants at Tyndall? Yeah. So first of all, um, I'm so humbled and honored that they named the schoolhouse after me. I can't, I mean, I can't even believe it. I remember a couple of years ago when Scout came to me and said, ma'am, I want to do this. And of course, we chatted about it. And, and between Scout and Mules, they worked really, really hard to make it all happen. And so I think it was a week ago that it all happened. And General Goldfein, the chief, did all that. So first of all, uh, to have my name up against that wall, against um, the building. And then to name the auditorium after me, Law Auditorium, right? I mean, I'm like, really? You know, I'm, I'm beside myself on all of that. Um, if I was to talk to the young ones, which every time I had the opportunity, whenever I was at Tyndall Air Force Base, I would go over to the school. They needed to realize how important their role was in combat air forces and that they were a part of that. They're not different. They're a part of that team. What they need to think about is the future of you know what we're doing again my life is different than your life your life will be different than theirs but how do they be a part of what's the future and be a part of something bigger than themselves and so that was always what i tried to tell the young ones because they think differently than i did so you've heard me say all this time i used to be a commander i used to be a general you know i'm an airman forever and i just happen to be a woman Right, you've heard me say that. And my point to them was, you have to do those things that are important to not just the career field, but the contribution of combat air power. Speaking of combat air power, you made history in 2014. You were chosen to be the commander. You earned the right to be the commander of Pacific Air Forces in Hawaii. And that made you the first female four-star commander of combat air forces and combat forces in general. And again, on May 13th, 2016, you became the commanding general of US Northcom. You were the first woman to command a unified combat and command. You made history, you, no matter what, you are a part of Air Force history. How do you feel about that? So I'm humbled, I'm honored. Again, just like putting my name up on a wall. But, but what's important to me in all of that are two things. Uh, the first is, I think that, or I hope that, both of those, that my experience and the things that I did over time made me the right person at the right place at the right time. 
not because I was a woman, you know, not because, you know, I did these other things, but I had the experience, I had the knowledge, I had the capability, and somebody said, you know what, she's the most capable person to do this, independent of gender, independent of race, independent of any of those things. It was, we want to pick the right person at the right place at the right time. I had the privilege to work for leaders that believed in me, independent of badge or wings, independent of anything else that says she is a leader, she is the one that can lead our forces in the Pacific, and she is the one that can lead our forces in NORAD and, and Northern Command. So I, I just think that, so two things, I think I had the capability and competence, and then I had leaders that believed in me. And having both of those is crucial uh, it is. for any leader, especially in it terms is. of being successful. It is. So it's, well, here's what's important. Again, I've learned over time that it's actually not about me. It's about everybody else. And so what I've tried to do or what I did try to do, I don't do anymore because I'm retired, um, uh, is that um, who are the people that I wanted to replace me? Who were the people that I mentored to be not the next Lori Robinsons, but to be the next wing commander, group commander, wing commander, NAV commander, you know, MAGCOM commander, you know? Who are those people? Because that's my responsibility as a, as a leader is to make it about them, not about me. And so that's to me what I just really learned over time of what was important because that's what happened to me. I finally realized it, right? I mean, I got, if you go back and look at my, uh, my career, I'm going to say a half and I don't need, don't, so don't judge me on the statistic, but of my jobs were non-women, non-fighter pilot. And I got put there by people who believed in me. So what I learned out of that is how do I take the people that I believe in and make sure that that person or people are put in the right place at the right time to flourish, not for themselves, but for our Air Force. Ma'am, you're dropping gems this morning. <laughs> I know we talk a lot about, this is not about being a female, this is not about nothing to do with gender, and I get that, ma'am. But one thing I have noticed, though, with uh, young female leaders is that kind of a trend item, and that's they have to be very conscious of how they go about their daily life. They don't want to be too assertive and it comes off aggressive or they just want to make sure they're giving off the right perception of people. Did you ever have to battle that at all? So I'll say a couple things about that. You can only imagine in 1984, 85, being the only woman as an instructor at the fighter weapons school, right? A bunch of fighter pilots. I was the only, you know, instructor for a year and a half, and so I had to learn that that bit of a balance, right? Of, you know, so I had I had I wore perfume because I didn't want to smell like them. Um, I had, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I mean, it's the little things. I'm in a flight suit, so I had my red nail polish because I'm living in Las Vegas, right? And so there there was a balance. But what I learned out of that time, quite frankly, was you can either be in somebody's face or you can try to figure out how to get everybody together. What I learned from that time and actually the follow on time, if you went to my, cause I went from weapons school to Hawaii to, to Tinker Air Force Base where I was the chief of tactics in the 965th, I would tell you, if you look at my time in, at the 965th, I think almost four out of five people in that, in that shop, you know, went to weapons school. And, and to me, it wasn't about me. It was about them. I'm raising them up. So, so the question is, as a woman, you know, you really, you do have to figure out this dynamic. But it's not just about the women. It's also about the men. Trust me. People that know me know that I can be a hard ass. 
I mean, I'm not the easiest person, but I didn't do it publicly. I did it. So let me give you a great example. So we got back when I was the ops group commander at Tinker, you know, we got back uh, from overseas and it's the first time in 35 years or no, I'm sorry, 25 years that all the airplanes and all the crews were home. First time in 25 years. I was incredibly proud of that, you know, and uh, the CFAC, then General Mosley, was like, Lori, we need to get you and your stuff home. And I'm like, CFAC, I'm ready. Let's move it out. So, so we get everybody home. And we end up having a couple of officer issues. And I'll leave it as general as that. But I wasn't going to let it sit. And so on a flying day, I brought all the officers in to the theater, called the room to attention, didn't allow them to sit till I got on the stage, said my first words, and then allowed them to sit. And I, I basically, you know, said to them, you know, are you kidding? Really? You know, we're having these issues? And, you know, it's probably a little harsher than that. But, but my, my point is that when I, when I was like that, it was very measured. It was very thought out. It wasn't off the cuff. It was not, I'm trying never, never uh, publicly, you know, say something bad about somebody, you know. Um, and I finished all that told them how proud I was that the first time all the jets are home, all the people are home. I left the auditorium or the theater. That, that rang uh, through the ops group, not just the officers, but all the enlisted people that weren't there because all the enlisted people were, I was like, I wonder what Colonel Robinson's gonna say. So we women do have to worry about that balance but men have to worry about it too. They can't say, oh, well, she's aggressive when their own mannerisms might be exactly the same. So, so I tried to be very measured. I tried very hard um, not to put bad stuff on people. On the other side of the coin, men have to go, oh, well, if I said the same thing, it would be looked at as, oh, wow, how great is that? So it's both sides of the equation, in my opinion. I would agree, too. And I would also add, ma'am, that as a male officer in the United States Air Force, it's important to speak up on behalf of females sometimes. Correct. Yes. So let me give you, are you are so right. Let me give you the best example. So when I got nominated to be the commander of Pacific Air Forces, about a week before I knew the nomination was going to come out, it's standard, standard stuff. The administration, you know, floats my name out there. That's what they always do, right? So I'm, I'm departing uh, Baltimore uh, from a meeting and I'm going back to Washington, D.C. And my sister calls me and she's in absolute tears. And I'm like, she's like, Lori, have you seen what they're saying about you? And I'm like, no, Carol, what are they saying? And she's like, oh, my God. You know, and, and on the blogs and all of that stuff is the fact that I'm a woman and who did I sleep with? And uh, yeah, and, and you know, my husband's favorite is she's so ugly. I mean, I'm, I'm not even going to get into it. So, you know, that learning environment of what people say, it's, it's hurtful. You know, it's hurtful. I end up on the phone all weekend long with the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief of the Air Force, Air Force, and I'm like, you know, I don't care what they say about me. I care about my family. That's what I care about. You know, they can say whatever they want about me, you know, I, whatever. But my family, my family hurts. So this is the part where I go down this, who came out? A guy by the name of Buona Breedlove, who at the time was the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force, 
who ends up becoming the supreme allied commander of Europe, as we called him, you know, El Supremo. Um, and we love him. And I've known him since I was a captain, but he came out on the email, he, and he goes, if there was ever anybody that could be the commander of Pacific Air Forces, it's Lori Robinson. To your point, men do need to come out in support, not only verbally, but visually and at the home. You know, I, I had the privilege to speak at a, at a conference that the Obama administration, and again, no politics there, I, it was just happened to be the time that, um, about women, and they asked me to come speak. And um, of course, I got to speak after uh, Oprah interviewed Michelle Obama. It doesn't get any better than that, does it? Are you, are you kidding me? Really? Dear Lord. Um, but, 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 I mean, wow, okay, you know, great. Um, but, but the last question Oprah asked Michelle was, okay, it was a, it was a, a women's conference and, but she asked, you know, there are some men in the room, which was probably my husband, my PAO and my aide, but she said, what would you say to the men in the audience? And she said, be better. That when you're taking care of your children, it's actually not babysitting. You're actually parenting, you know, like be better. And, and, and so this is the notion, in, in my opinion, in a squadron, in a group, because women do one thing, men should not, should not go, oh, what the hell is that? Well, maybe I would have done the same thing, you know, so I'm, I'm pretty adamant about that. And I was blessed with amazing, great leaders. I was blessed with people that believed in me, independent of my badge um, and wings. But I was also blessed with people that I had the privilege to work with. Ma'am, you are awesome. And I, and I tell you, I couldn't agree with you more. Do you know what GOAT means? Yes. And I'm not. Yes. Ma'am, in terms of air battle managers, you are... <laughs> the GOAT. And for those who are watching and listening and don't know what GOAT means, it's the greatest of all time, right? And when we got on uh, this call earlier, you said that sometimes you forget who you are and what you've done. How? <laughs> How can you forget it? That, because like, even the instructors at the doghouse, when they talk about you, it's just like a, that, and like the lights get super bright and it's like she is the epitome of air battle management ma'am so how can how how can you forget this it's not that i forget it i don't want to i i don't want to how do i say this so i'll say this differently i understand the things that i've done i really do i mean i i rationally you know i'm a rational person i'm an emotional but i'm a rational person too and so I rationally understand if I look back and if you pulled out my bio and you would go, look at all this stuff that you've done, blah, 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 blah. But I would also say it wasn't about me. I, I got sent the other day um, before the whole building naming thing happened from my vice commander when I was at um, Tinker Joe Rizzacci, who I'm absolutely so blessed to have had the privilege to work with him. And he sent me this whole thing. Hey, Lori, remember when you, you know, went down to Tyndall and you're like, okay, we need to make the flying part of this because we need to make our young ones be able to fly. And, and so that the timing for them works out, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, to me, it was not about me. It was about our future. It was about making sure that our future was, was taken care of. So thank you for your accolades. But really, to me, it's always been about our future. And it's been caring and grateful that I had people that believed in me, put me in places where I should never have been. Two, that I had the strength and the voice to say what I thought. And, and then three, people that listened. Um, and so uh, I, I just, 
you know, I'm just grateful for, for all of that. And, and, you know, I, two weeks ago or a week ago, whenever it was when they did the building naming thing, you know, um, I'm sure you saw it. And, you know, I was crying like a baby because I'm like, I can't believe this, you know? I, I mean, I just, I, 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 one, I'm not quite dead yet. Um, and, and, and secondly, I, I really can't believe it. And I can't wait to go back to Tyndall, you know, once we get out of this environment that we're in and to sit down with the class because it, it, was, it was my favorite thing to do, quite frankly. And um, I loved sitting there talking to them and telling them how bright their future was and how amazing they are and how blessed they are to be a part of our United States Air Force and to be airmen. It's incredible. Man, we're going to switch gears because I think we, we're both taking in deep breaths over here. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's all good. It's all good. One thing I always ask any leader whenever I get on a, a mentorship moment with them is if you can go back in time to your Air Force career and change anything about the Air Force, about something you got wrong or something you got right that you could have made better, what would it be? I got to tell you, dude, I wouldn't change a thing. I, 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 I you know, I, I, you know, people ask me that a lot and I, and I really do contemplate that, but I, I, I just really wouldn't. First of all, I got put in situations. I got to do things. I got to see things. My husband and I talk a lot about, you know, when I was the commander at Pacific Air Forces, you know, I went to South Korea a couple of times, Japan, China, New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, I mean, India, you know, I got to see and do things that little Lori Robinson never expected in her life. She was just little Lori Robinson, for God's sake. You know, I mean, she was just an air battle manager. You know, um, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm privileged to have worked for great people like John Jumper. He's my mentor. He is the guy that said to me, you're a part of something bigger than yourself. And I'm like, what the hell does he mean? Um, and then I kind of figured it out. But he's been my mentor for years and he's still my mentor. I wouldn't change anything. Or there are things that I learned over time or, you know, maybe thought, hmm, what about that? You know, I mean, if you talk to my husband when I left Newport um, from going to school there and they were sending to me to the Defense Information Service Agency, I think it's service, DISA. There's a whole story behind it, not important at the moment. But I thought that was the end of my career. You know, I thought, well, I'm going to this communication place. I'm an air battle manager. But at the end of the day, it all worked out just quite fine, you know? And it worked out not, not just because I tried to do the best that I could do, and that's what I would tell all your viewers, be the best that you can be every single day, no matter what job they gave you, gave you or give you. Um, but the other side is I had people that were like, okay, move her on. But I wouldn't change the thing. I just really wouldn't. Because um, you're handed these things. Go do it with enthusiasm. Be the best at whatever they hand you. Ma'am, I'm going to get ready to close this thing out. Uh, but I want you to hang on after I close that, if that's, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but I picked this up the other day. I think it was, it was, I think it was like two days ago. And certain, I am a firm, I have, I'm a very, uh, I'm a firm believer in God and faith and just how things work. And I didn't know why I got it. I was like, man, this is cool. I want to get it. And I want to read it to you. It says, just think you're here, not by chance, but by God's choosing to fulfill his special purpose for this generation. And now I know I got it. It was for you. So I want to thank you uh, for your time. For those of you who are listening and watching, uh, I have the pleasure of not only meeting virtually uh, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, but having an amazing conversation. I hope and pray that you all got as much out of this experience that I've had. And ma'am, give me your final thoughts before we get out of here. 
So I'm going to say two things. One, every night I have a book next to my bed and it's a daily prayer. And I sit back, you know, and um, I read it and I think about it. It's my way of starting the decompression part of my day at the end of the den- at the end of the night. And I think it's important, whatever I don't, whatever your religion, whatever your spiritual, you know, thoughts are. You know that time is so important. Whether it's morning or night, it doesn't matter. What it, you know, it just doesn't matter. But I've learned a lot about that. And then, secondly, thank you for you. You know, thank you for you know being a thought leader as a young one in our military and um, and encouraging all of us old people um, to um, be a part of this. I think it's very very important. And um, you make us better. And we need you to be better. All of us need you. And so thank you for doing this. And thank you for allowing me the privilege to be a part of this. Everybody, we will see you all next week. Have a great day.